I'd like to, uh, to welcome you back and to introduce our speaker for today, uh, P. Hong Chen, who is um, currently the uh, CEO and chairman of the board for Broad Vision Incorporated. He's a Berkeley alum. He, go ahead. Uh, he founded Gain Technologies, which was acquired by Sybase. He, at Sybase, he was a vice president of multimedia technology. In uh, 1993, he founded the current company, Broad Vision. And, um, and also around that time, he was an early investor in Siebel Systems Corporation, and he currently, um, well, anyway, he's a current investor in Siebel Systems. And he's uh, a very strong proponent of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship education. So with that, uh, it's really my honor to present Ai Hong Chen. OK, good afternoon. It's a, a real pleasure to be back to Berkeley. Um, most of you are uh, about the same age as my son. So uh, uh, I would completely understand if uh, you find what I'm going to tell you today uh, to be making no sense to you at all, because that's how, how my son feels about whatever I tell him. You know. So, uh, and um, so I arrived at Berkeley in 1983. So next year will be uh, the 20th sort of anniversary. And uh, after I graduated, uh, admitted into uh, the PhD program. And I, I'm really, really very glad that that was the choice I made. Instead of going to my other sort of decision was uh, UT Austin. Um, so uh, very glad that I made the right decision. And uh, so this, this is what I, what I wrote down uh, when I decided to come to Berkeley. And I also wrote down in my uh, notebook, uh, so how far is it to Berkeley? It's very close, and it's very close, I wrote. Uh, my timing was excellent. When I got here, uh, Berkeley had just finished the Berkeley Unix, famous uh, Berkeley Unix BSD, and had started the uh, commercialization. Uh, some microsystem had just been founded. Uh, I did not overlap with Bill Joy, but I got to know him quite well uh, since then. But he had just left Berkeley to found Sun Microsystems. Uh, Ingress, the dawn of relational database, also had just been commercialized into the Ingress Corporation, uh, which my wife actually ended up working for. This is also the dawn of the Macintosh, or the GUI, as we know it today. And a fairly interesting technology called PostScript which we know today by PDF or Acrobat. So I was very much in the thick of that at Berkeley. Uh, I befriended also with Eric Schmidt, who I later on brought to the board at Siebel. And now, as you know, he's the CEO of uh, Google. Uh, I worked for, uh, for him uh, as a summer job at Xerox Park. I also collaborated with uh, uh, Jim Gosling, who we now know him as Mr. Java. And sitting next to my office, I kind of locked myself when I got here at uh, Evans Hall, at a windowless uh, small office for five years until they allowed me to graduate. Um, and sitting next to me, another windowless office, was a visiting scholar by the name of Richard Stallman, sort of Mr. Open Source. Uh, and. Uh, he was kind of yelling and shouting all day long. I don't know what the heck is going on in that office. But anyway, um, so I kind of you know, got here at a very good time and really had a wonderful time learning and doing research here. And, uh, but toward the last couple of years, even though I, I think I did pretty well in all my research, and in fact, I think I still have a piece of code that I wrote called Make Index, which Berkeley, I think, is still selling right now through the uh, license office and collecting some, uh, hopefully, collecting some money. I think I have 
stopped receiving uh, my uh, loyalty checks uh, a few years ago, but before that I was getting some checks from Berkeley every year. So I don't know what, uh, what happens to that. Um, <laughs> in fact, many, many years later, I actually got some email from some customer support issues from somebody in uh, Sweden asking me to uh, no, debug that for him. And I said, you know, sorry, <laughs> can't even uh, find the, uh, uh, no, the source code anymore. Uh, anyways, I, I did have a revelation because toward the end of my research, um, uh, we had a guy joining our group uh, who uh, was kind of marginally a Berkeley student. He uh, is not a CS major. He uh, tried to become an anthropology major but got flunked uh, in that program also. But that's a very important uh, sort of person in my life because through John, who can basically pour code out, out of his fingers like that, you know, I realized this is not my business, okay? I'm just not as good a coder. Doesn't matter whether John is a CS major or not. It's just abundantly clear to me at that point that I need to find myself a different job, you know? So 20 years later, basically what I've been doing, uh, rather than trying to pour coal out of my fingers, was being involved in uh, either um, uh, directly building or uh, help funding or help building uh, new companies, mainly in uh, software or, or in uh, internet. Uh, so while a number of these companies went bust, um, we did, uh, you know, some of them, these may not be household, household names, but uh, some of them did make it. And uh, uh, some of them actually now look still very, very promising. Which is why in, uh, I think, year 2000, there was an issue of Business Week that caused me uh, an, a serial entrepreneur. I'm very glad that they didn't, they didn't label me a serial killer. But um, So I hope I'm kind of somewhat qualified to uh, you know, share with you a thing or two that I've learned over the last 20 years since I left. Uh, Berkeley. So the agenda today is, uh, is this. I want to tell you five different rules that I've learned from my career, from zero to 100. Uh, the zero percent rule, the 20 percent, 50 percent, 90 percent, 100 percent. All of these are probably very familiar to you in different facets of your lives, uh, but let's just try to maybe kind of consolidate them into one common theme here. Number one, the zero percent rule, uh, or also known as the free rule. Now first, there's this famous uh, sort of uh, uh, a phrase from uh, Mr. Duo that everything that can be invented has been invented. If you search on uh, Google, you'll find that actually most experts challenge, uh, especially the, a bunch of people from the patent office saying that Mr. Duo never said this okay, before, but be it as it may, um, this is kind of an interesting question and or observation. So, uh, you know, what happened was is that obviously Yahoo came out, you know, really, really game busters, extremely successful. So a few years later, when a bunch of kids came to me and said that they want to create a Yahoo for China, and it had been the company called Sina, I kind of got it immediately. Okay, so I put in some investment, and I've been sitting on, on their board for now almost 10 years on Sina. Indeed, Sina, we're now the number one portal in China. Uh, we got over, well over 100 million subscribers, uh, very, very successful, very, um, uh, very powerful company. But I must admit that I was actually also an investor with Google, not directly, but through a fund that I was in. So when Google was brought to my attention, I forget when, maybe 97, 98, when they first got started, my immediate reaction was, geez, how in the hell the world would need another search engine, okay? I really have to admit to you, I just really, really did not get it, 
Okay, did not get it at all. Um, and of course, you know, everything after that, such as Baidu, which is the Google in China, or all these other things like MySpace, YouTube, you all know, we're just talking about that, and Skype. Okay. All these things, the sort of the next generation internet business was really something that was somewhat sort of, I really missed that in terms of how they ended up being such a powerful business model. Because see, what's really kind of very hard and extremely, very hard to, to compete with or extremely compelling as a business model is when it's free, right? And who would have thought that with the almighty Microsoft being around for such a long time that today there's actually something physically, whether it's in reality, you know, in terms of users or in terms of sheer sort of uh, market power, brand power or uh, war chest to be able to seriously challenge uh, whatever Microsoft is doing or offering. And by the way, doing so in a, in, a, in a very hard to refuse kind of business model, which basically essentially is free. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that it would be possible, you know, but somebody did kind of make, make it happen. So this notion of everything that can be invented has been invented. Boy, no, I couldn't be more wrong um, about that than understanding now and realizing that, you know, there's something new every day. So really what's going on with something like a Google or YouTube or any of things like of that ilk right now is, is that they, in terms of whether it's the business model or creating a sustainable long-term business, is that they figure out a way to, number one, be able to really scale the business to such a you know, tremendous sort of uh, order of magnitude while being able to really offer you know, basically zero cost to the customer. Uh, zero cost whether it either it's to the um, uh, consumer, which is net zero. I don't know if you have all used, I'm sure you do, Gmail or the new G calendar. You know, it's really very, very compelling compared to Microsoft Office. But to us, it's zero cost. Or even to advertisers, you know, very, very economical and reasonable costs. And they, they set up this market economy for the advertisers to pretty much de determine what the price ought to be by themselves rather than having to set up a huge, huge sales force like the traditional software business would need to be in order to drive revenues. So it's, uh, it's an incredible business model. But the key is, is that it's, it, it does, it, you, you need to build a business that can sustain, which as I have learned in my own career, it's probably the hardest thing, okay? You really, if you think about it, you have to give a lot of credit to the company, especially in high tech, like an HP or IBM, that can last so long and still be thriving. It's, let me tell you, it's really hard, okay? And uh, in, in our kind of cutthroat business. So in that regard, on the sustainability side, is to be able to truly figure out a way to monetize that and by doing so, establishing a big war chest that makes the competition really cringe and make, the comp it, it make it very difficult for people to try to come into your business. So establishing a huge barrier of entry. Okay, so something, something like a Google, I mean, comparing their business model, say, to a Yahoo, uh, it just couldn't be more different because in a Google model, you have millions and millions of advertisers even though everyone may be only paying $100. But in Yahoo, their, their entire customer base or advertiser base is probably only, I don't know exactly, but Asina, which is smaller than Yahoo, but sort of by comparison, we probably only have 500 customers, advertisers. So it's very, very, a very different scale. And therefore, uh, sort of this kind of <coughs> sort of a broad-based sort of a business model just extremely powerful, extremely compelling. So lesson learned here is, is I think um, those of us that came from a very sort of canonical computer science or engineering background, 
we have to realize that you know, there is a huge, couple of huge trends going on, which is you know, somebody can really, really take a serious piece of technology like Google does and completely popularize it into the consumer space. Okay? You can call that either the enterprisation of consumer or the consumerization of enterprise. Either way, when you look at it, is that when you can make the nouns becoming a verb, you would truly have made it. Okay? Um, our company started to really broadly, uh, we have about 200 people across the world. Uh, about March this year, we started to adopt Skype across the company. And I think we're now saving about 50% of uh, global telecom costs. Okay? Uh, why? Because it's free. Now, how can you, I mean, quality, not as great, but most people at the end of the day probably can, can live with that. And um, it, it's just really, really compelling. Like I said, you know, free is good. But of course, we have to watch out for all the pitfalls. You know, when someone as successful as a Google or Skype, there's going to be a million copycats. Um, and of course, most of them are not going to make it. The other sort of uh, phenomenon is that there will be a lot of uh, sort of specialization or segmentation or verticalization. <coughs> Uh, just be aware not to go overboard on that because you don't want to cut your own opportunities into too thin a slice. That there's just no way to, uh, to leverage that. Um, many, many years ago, this is for when I first started looking at investments and uh, being an angel investor, uh, somebody came to me and gave a very compelling pitch. Okay, this is a movie guy. He's actually an MBA. And he said, you know, geez, I've analyzed all the hot hit movies. Uh, his interest is in action movies, so he analyzed from you know, 50 years till today, Indiana Jones, uh, Star Wars, and everything. And he basically came up with a business plan that says, hey, if my, our movies, which he's going to make three episodes, can hit all these key things, which I've distilled out of the 100 movies I analyzed that all have made a hit, okay? And, and I just want, I just, all I need to do is make sure my script covers all these hundred things. Bang, 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 bang. Then the movie that, I, that we will create would, would be guaranteed to be a hit based on that rationale. So I put in, I think, 100 grand to this uh, venture because you basically own the, the right to the script. Turned out to be a total bust, of course. Um, and, you know, of course, the guy's a, a Stanford guy, so, you know, we don't. It's not a surprise. Uh, Stanford MBA. Um, the other area that I've invested that always consistently turned into a bus is restaurants. So, you know, just kind of two side notes here. <clears throat> All right, so rule number two, another very familiar rule, 80-20 uh, rule, which is really about a very simple sort of uh, heuristic uh, as observed by uh, Pareto, 80% of consequences always stem from 20% causes. And this has been kind of around for at least 100 years, certainly longer than that. I think throughout human history, we probably got you know, endless examples or experiences of this, of this nature. So as Pareto himself observed in Italy, he says, hey, you know, eighty percent of our wealth actually owned by twenty percent of our population. Okay, uh, if you look at traffic, of course, you know, uh, we get into congestions probably on, on twenty percent of roads create you know eighty percent of our congestions. If you look at call centers, uh, which we as a company deal with quite a lot, our customers do in customer service. You know, twenty percent. 80% of the complaints for all your customers probably will concentrate on 20% of the issues or cases. For all users of uh, Windows, we all know that 80% of us users probably use less than 20% of the features in the product. In fact, some studies have shown that 99% of us use less than 10% or actually 10 features in Word. Okay? You can go back and count how many things you actually do. Not a whole heck of a lot. But if you try to count again, you kind of blow up the entire menu structure of uh, a, something like a word, you probably get thousands and thousands of features. Okay? But most of us use, use less than 10. 
which is even more true in enterprise software. This is I am in. Okay, this is about consumer software, but enterprise software is probably even more guilty, <coughs> guilty about that. In fact, um, one of the guys that used to work for me now is a very senior guy, development manager, uh, VP at SAP. He was telling me, I ran into him in the flight to Germany recently, he was telling me that SAP building a new generation of their ERP system and uh, the team across the world, globe, is 2,500 programmers, 2,500. Okay, so I very politely reminded him to go back and read the book Mythical Men Month because I just don't know how you can get something to work with 2,500 people working on a piece of code. Um, entertainment business, which we kind of alluded to earlier, of course, is a hit and miss business. So, you know, 80 percent of the, uh, the business revenue or profits will probably come from 20 percent of the hits which both very well, uh, very true also with any uh, you know, investment or startups, venture capital. If you count their, all their IRRs, uh, you know, 80% of their returns probably will come from 20% of the companies that they invested in. In fact, probably more, more dramatic than that. You know, if you can hit a Google or YouTube for that matter, uh, you can probably afford to make 100 mistakes. Okay. So it's a very interesting business to be in. Yeah. I bet you 80% of the profits in venture capital are made by 20% of the firm. <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you know this, but another interesting derivative of 80-20 is is actually 64-5. Because if you do it one more time, it kind of narrows very, very quickly, right? So first order, second order, very, very quickly you can, you can understand how you, how you uh, zero in. So in computer science, how many of you are ECS or CS? Yeah, quite a lot of you. So you probably know what I'm talking about here, right? In any code, uh, you have this notion of an inner loop, which is probably executed 80% of the time. And often that may be just one line, okay? Uh, and home page, we deal with our companies do uh, websites. And we often find our customers get carried away, reminiscent of when uh, sort of the uh, desktop publishing was first invented in the 80s. Some people would get carried away and put on, you know, 100 different fonts in the same document just to be kind of fancy. Uh, so in the home page, most, some people, our customers, actually often would get carried away and would have, you know, 100 scripts on it or something like that. Okay, so obviously the performance would be extremely poor when you have such a, a big bottleneck. So one thing, the only thing I think I learned uh, taking up uh, computer science courses here at Berkeley was a course taught by uh, Professor uh, Dave Patterson. Uh, I think it was uh, Architecture 152, CS 152. Is it still called 152? Patterson says, there's only three words about computer science. Cash, cash, and cash. Uh, and that really is about 80-20, isn't it, right? What is a cache? A cache is a pre about predicting what are the 20% of the, the inner loop that people are going to hit. And I think you'll find similarity of this in all engineering disciplines, in fact, in all business disciplines. The bottom line really is, is that you need to optimize, we as an engineer, we need to optimize towards where you can be, get the biggest bang for the buck, but doing so not by making shortcuts or cutting corners. This is not about compromising. This is about optimizing toward where things are most critical and most important. In other words, you need to look for that jingle, that little melody that just rings and rings and rings and really kind of, I always wonder, because I'm not a psychiatrist, a psychologist, but you no, know, why would some melody resonate and some would not? And, and the 80-20 is about catching on to that jingle and, and do not over-engineer uh, and, and so uh, an overkill or, you know, it's, frankly, you don't really get any extra credit uh, to be a, a perennial uh, overachiever. In fact, often we can learn our lesson from the counterexample. The, um, the sort of uh, biggest and the baddest 
perennial overachiever is actually Dr. Fraser Crane, as you probably, if you ever, I am a big fan of Fraser, so you know, I, I really like the show. So in this episode, I think it was uh, a few years ago, their station chief asked him to uh, actually compose. He knew him, knows that he's a pretty good musician, compose a jingle. And what Fraser ended up doing is essentially turning that into a, a, a operetta, complete with you know, the orchestra and his brother Miles uh, doing a recital. It's just a big mess, you know. And, uh, and at the end, they, they, so of course, they didn't buy this. And uh, his dad, instead, this blue collar worker, just by accident came out with a jingle. It turned out to be what the station ended up adopting, okay? So just remember, you know, this is about 80-20 and about that little jingle. Don't overkill it. Next rule is the 50% rule, or it's, it's not, you know, half and half rule. Obviously, it's not a half milk and half um, cream, but it's about this famous adage, you know, is the glass half full or half empty? Now, according to uh, Bill Cosby, Depends on whether you are pouring or you are drinking. Okay. Now, what do we mean by this? It really means that there is, a, uh, again, I'm not a fortune teller, okay, so that's, that's not the intent here. And I'm not a Taoist either. But based on my experience for the top past 20 years, it is very, very true that there is an yin and there's a yang in your business, okay? And you just have to be able to endure when you are in the dark side, and then be very mindful when you are on the sunny side of the moon. Because like, uh, like this famous sort of uh, uh, idiom here, you know, good often spawns from the bad, and vice versa. Let's look at, take a look at an example. My biggest hero as an entrepreneur, like probably that of many of yours, is uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, and I actually was at his speech that he gave, I think, at Stanford uh, a couple years back um, about his life experience. It's really very, very moving. I, I think this guy is a tremendous guy. So if you look at his company from the, for the last 30 years, it's hard to kind of believe that Apple is already 30 years old, okay? Certainly from my perspective, probably not from you, for you. But so he started the company in 1976, and by now, today, I think they are about $70 billion market cap, okay? Hugely successful company. But this is not without a lot of yin's and yang's in this whole journey. Those of you may or may not know, in fact, something actually pretty dramatic happened in his career because he was forced out of Apple in 1985. Uh, and he started a new company called Next in 1986, trying to create the next Apple. But by 1991, it was so unsuccessful, this new piece of hardware, although it's really, really cool. Many of you probably never seen that. Uh, but it is really, really nice, okay? Uh, reminds me, in fact, of the stuff that Xerox Park had created, the, the whole uh, computer workstations. Very nice. But by 1991, five years later, they have decided to stop manufacturing the hardware and concentrating only on their software. Um, and uh, by 1996, uh, through some kind of very uh, interesting uh, sort of twist and turns, Steve had returned to Apple and in fact, Apple had acquired all the remaining technologies from Next. And in fact, I don't know if you know this, but everything that they have done at Next, this infrastructure, this technology software, ended up being the key infrastructure that's now today enabling uh, iTunes. So I'm sure you all use that. Uh, but that's really what's sitting behind what you see. Uh, and so without this so detour, uh, Apple certainly would not have been what it is today. Again, five years ago, no one would have predicted that Apple today would have a bigger market cap than Dell. Okay? 
uh, and it's just such a turnaround. It's just unbelievable, extremely, extremely uh, compelling story here. Uh, in fact, uh, we recently were selling stuff to uh, Apple stores and realizing that you know, we need to integrate with this technology, um, which you know, really, other than Apple, nobody is using anymore. But it kind of doesn't matter because it's really uh, extremely, extremely successful behind this sort of incredible um, piece of uh, sort of uh, uh, both in terms of the device and then the service behind that. So back to this, uh, this theme that I had touched upon earlier, sustainability. So when you talk about good fortunes and bad fortunes and how do you really kind of deal with that and manage that to your advantage. Uh, a few years ago, I think um, maybe five years ago, I was attending a conference in, in Europe and they invited uh, Bill Gates to be the keynote speaker. And after his speech, some people asked him a, a question. So, so uh, Mr. Gates, what's the, your ideal model about your company's growth? So given what Microsoft, how successful Microsoft has been, you would have thought that this would be his answer. No, indeed, if you look at Microsoft's sort of growth curve, you know, market cap wise, which of course is a direct function of their revenue and uh, profitability, it would obviously look like this. But that's not what he said. He said, actually, that's not the model I like. The, the right model, I believe, for a company is that. It's actually a step function rather than a hockey stick. And you kind of wonder a little bit, which I did, why is that? And I think what then the uh, ensuing explanations that he gave really convinced me that this is a very, very unusual guy. You know, this is a guy that's really uh, got everything figured out because it's really, really important that sometimes, you know, you have time to ponder, you have time to strategize, to regroup, and uh, you have the opportunity to plan for the future. And when you are always in this kind of a, a phase, it's really almost impossible to deal with uh, the necessary regrouping and thinking and development and other things. So I think this really got a lot of insight and a lot of wisdom in wh what he's saying in terms of how to manage a company's growth. Rule number four, the 90% rule, also known as the last mile rule, okay? Uh, here, the first 90 constitute only a 50% of a 100 mile journey. Put it the other way, the last mile often is at least 50% of the effort, okay? So the col corollary of this rule is really that the last mile is extremely important. Those of you football fans like I am, and anybody who follows 49ers I have been for the last 20 years, we very much sympathize with what we're saying here. Getting down to the one yard line often is a curse, not a blessing, okay? Because if you cannot punch it in, it's a complete waste of time, and it's very demoralizing. I'm very glad that we don't have that problem this year at Cal. And, uh, and uh, but, Geez, you know, this is, this is a very, very tough thing to endure, to, uh, to, to kind of stomach when you can't get a job done when you're already at the one yard line. And there are just ample examples in our industry like that. You know, we, all these are well documented and, you know, kind of well um, analyzed, whether it's VCR, you know, the fortunes transforming from MPEX. But our, my company now lives, lives in the same campus uh, as MPEX, their original uh, so facilities, uh, transforming all the good fortunes to Sony, uh, or you know, too numerous to, to mention, uh, PC companies uh, consolidated into IBM PC, uh, Nintendo taking everything away from Atari. The most famous fumbling the future example 
I know if you all read that book called Fumbling the Future from Xerox Park, being taken, <laughs> taken away by Steve Jobs into Macintosh. Uh, the next one is my favorite. You know, everybody would have thought that the Japanese, if anybody, the Japanese would have figured this out. But in bubble, bubble printer and inkjet printers, it, it is the US, it is HP, who really got it figured out. Um, and uh, uh, be able to uh, really become a, a dominant, in fact, a, a, a kind of a cash machine, cash cow for HP. Uh, you buy a printer for $69. And a tiny little cartridge now for sixty-nine dollars. Also, no, man, it's good business. Uh, and uh, no, the World Wide Web, right? We all know, familiar with probably. I don't. I, I hope you're not too young for that. About this big fight between uh, Netscape and uh, Mosaic and Microsoft. It's, so it's very good to see Mosaic coming back as uh, as uh, Firefox, right? Fire and of course, you know, our uh, Starbucks, it's, it's very heartening for American to go to Vienna now and see a Starbucks there uh, and kind of dominating around the world. And then, of course, uh, we already mentioned Google. Uh, this one I really did not get, but I, I think I do now. And of course, uh, the hot, hot thing right now, like the previous uh, for a, a, a hybrid car that actually was invented here, but then uh, now being totally uh, dominated by Toyota and the Japanese <coughs> again. So what are the lessons learned here? I think it's a little bit hard in this case to really pinpoint one single thing. It, it, uh, it really is a multitude of things. Uh, it could be because of timing or luck. It could be because of superior quality like the Japanese do, or uh, service. It could be um, smarter marketing, or just a more compelling business model like Google. So it could be really any of those things. But rarely, rarely recognize that it's because of te technology. Okay? Very rarely is it purely because of technology that somebody be able to punch into the end zone and score a touchdown. Okay? And that's something that we all need to think about and be aware of. In fact, the bigger the company, the, uh, 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 but before we get there, it, it's really to recognize that high tech industry as we are in is also uh, a pretty mature business. So even high tech is, is, not, is not immune from uh, the cyclical nature of the business. Even under Moore's law, you will find you know, you look at applied materials, you know. Uh, and so it's truly, truly uh, a business that you just have to re realize that there's always the, 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 the light, the bright face of the moon and the dark face of the moon. <clears throat> the bigger the company, it turns out I think it's easier to fumble. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to do intrapreneurship than it is, of course, in entrepreneurship. And, uh, and most people would know, unless you're Cisco, you know, who are really extremely good at this, M&A, it's just very, very difficult to make it work. Okay? So um, what I'm really trying to tell you here is that if you are and, and become an entrepreneur, you have to realize that nothing is more important than patience and perseverance. Uh, because, you know, even though we all hope that we can be a YouTube, two years we sell it for $1.6 billion. But that's once in a lifetime. It does not happen very often at all. Okay? In fact, it probably happens you know, once every you know, million. You know, that kind of order of magnitude. The you know, market really matures much, much more slowly than you think. Okay? Uh, and in fact, in all cases, at least 10 years, a decade, if not longer. I remember I attended the first MPAC meeting, worldwide meeting conference. It was in 1992. Okay? Uh, and 15 years later, indeed, I believe personally, MPAC really saved Japan's economy. 
okay? Because if we're not MPEG that got started so long ago and finally the whole maturation process and fermentation and all that, that finally you're able to have one common standard and be able to produce a lot of great devices inexpensively to the consumer, whether it's DVD, MPEG-3, uh, and uh, MP3, uh, HDTV, all these things are the things you know, that really, really turn the Japanese economy around eventually after really essentially 15 years of recession. So um, you need to be really, really patient um, because now things are much, much more back to normal after the bubble and the post-bubble, so nuclear winter. I think things are finally come to a normal uh, sort of uh, stage where a typical startup just takes, you know, a number of years to, uh, to mature and to, to sort of make it. So finally, the last rule is the 100% rule, which I also call the flat rule. Of course, uh, uh, Tom Freeman's work, I'm sure you're already very familiar with. Um, and uh, which is also why recently, last year, uh, Steve uh, Black, who's uh, the co-CEO of uh, JP Morgan, was giving a, giving a, a speech at Warden School. And after the speech, a student asked him, so where, where should I go or what should I do after I graduate? And his answer, straight answer, buy a one-way ticket to Asia, okay? Um, which is also why a friend of mine who's the vice chairman of Goldman Sachs recently sent uh, his daughter, who's a Princeton grad, not to Harvard Business School, his uh, alma mater, for MBA, but instead decided to send her to Tsinghua University in Beijing for her MBA, okay? Why is that? Well, it's because like exactly like what Patton said, or George Scott said, I don't know if Patton actually said this, but at least George Scott did it in the movie, right? You don't want to be kind of left behind. And of course, you know Patton, George Patton actually is from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. So you don't want your uh, grandson to uh, kind of feel embarrassed that you were not in the action, OK? So is the world really flat, OK? In my opinion, it's actually already a little slanted. Uh, you look at the world's top IT services companies. In fact, the top three now are all Indian firms. They are no longer Western firms. And isn't that interesting? Although that, this might be a little bit inflated because it's, um, these firms are listed on the, uh, the Bombay Stock Exchange, uh, or Mumbai Stock Exchange. So their market cap there is, is kind of more inflated than a uh, New York Stock Exchange. But nevertheless, you look at the top three Indian uh, services firms combined in revenues and in market cap today versus their next six largest competitors in the Western world, four of them in the United States, the next two in Europe. Their revenues are only 10% of their six next uh, six largest competitors, but their market cap combined turned out to be 30% higher than the next six combined, okay? So that's kind of quite telling. Then there's China, of course, well, again, documented and publicized and analyzed. Being a student of uh, history, we will recognize that, in fact, China for the longest time, probably well over 1,500 years, you know, 15, 16 centuries since the collapse of uh, the Roman Empire till the Industrial Revolution, China, in fact, was the world's largest economy, bar none, okay, the wealthiest country in the world. But for probably a million reasons, it failed to participate in the Industrial Revolution in the 18th, 19th century and really fell you know, far, far behind. So in the ensuing 300 years, China was very, very poor and pretty miserable. But most experts now predict, of course, it will become the world's largest economy again in probably another 20, 25 years. Although it would take them another 25 years, probably by the middle of this century, to match our living standard in the uh, Western world completely. 
But this growth, of course, is due to the fact that its uh, annual growth rate has been over 10% a year now for the last many, many years and in a foreseeable uh, several years. Uh, and the reason for that 10% growth comes from three areas. Number one is tremendous build out in infrastructures by the government projects. Uh, just in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, the three major cities alone, over the next three years, between now and the Olympics, two years, they will spend $100 billion building airports, freeways, uh, this and that. Um, the other is a, uh, the rise of the true middle class there. Uh, of course, everybody's definition about middle class is somewhat different, but by and large, this means people being able to afford house, their own houses, uh, cars, and have disposable income to uh, travel, and so on and so forth. The spending is going to be pretty incredible. It already is. But in uh, another 15 years or so, they would boast uh, over 400 million middle class consumers. And then, of course, China is now the world's manufacturing center. So it builds essentially everything we use across the world. So a lot of selling. And because of that, all the experts, of course, exports, of course, that uh, they now have the world's largest foreign reserves, uh, exceeding uh, this year probably over a trillion dollars. So they're actually supporting the US dollars and the US uh, Treasury as a pretty big factor now. Missing the entire Industrial Revolution, China did. Uh, they are a very active participant in the digital revolution now. As we know, they now have over 400 million wireless subscribers, subscribers, and there are well over 150 million in internet subscribers, half of which is already broadband, which is actually a bigger population than the U.S. has now. Universities are churning out over a quarter of a million uh, Java programmers a year. Okay, and we're kind of a witness of that. We, as a company, recently started a new venture there uh, and just hired 20 you know, fresh students, graduates from uh, different schools in Beijing. Uh, and, and you see the sort of really the commoditization, globalization really in play here. Extremely, extremely interesting and compelling experience. So, what do we do you now? Being here at Berkeley, at the, at the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, one of the best schools of the world in terms of technology. Um, how do we navigate this new world? Um, in my opinion, it is really crucial that you develop yourself into <coughs> having a forest view rather than just a tree view. What we're missing in the industry right now are people who can give us skills in looking at the big picture, managing the bigger issues, designs, architecture, stuff like that. Okay? This has been the case, of course, in more mature industry like semiconductors, where the separation of work and division of skills has been pretty well figured out. But in the rest of the IT industry, this is just starting to uh, recognize this. And there are a lot of controversies even over the last few years about all sourcing and this and that. I personally see no issue there. It's an opportunity for our own students and our own workforce in this high tech area to actually uh, elevate into a higher level and by doing so becoming more profitable uh, in all aspects of our jobs. Product management, extremely critical and scarce skills and resources. Okay? Project management, needless to say, we need to learn how to manage people across the world. Okay? Maybe Moscow, maybe Romania. Uh, today is in Beijing, tomorrow will be in Vietnam, everywhere. Okay? I hope one day they will be in Africa. Uh, that's, that's how things would evolve. No, there's just no question. So waste discussing or arguing about outsourcing is just a complete waste of time. Okay? It's proven again and again in every industry that it will happen because that's the law of economics. 
And then you need to know how to develop local best practices. So the same best practice here does not apply there and vice versa. We at Sina, for example, is a media company. So we have to really be very sensitive to what the government cares about okay, in order to do business there, uh, which is obviously not something Yahoo needs to worry about. At Sina, we have to be very, very careful about what appears on our website, okay? even stuff from blogs. Okay? So that's a lot of extra work and cost for us to be able to uh, deal with that. But if we don't do that, no, we really would not be successful in doing our business there. Same thing is going on with, for example, comparing Baidu to uh, Google, both of which are search companies, very similar kind of uh, business. But boy, in Google, everything is pretty automated. If you're an advertiser, you go on their advertiser site and you can pretty much you know, sign up and buy your ads. But in Baidu, uh, very different because there's not a lot of trust in China. So they have to employ a lot of uh, street fighters going into every little you know, barber shops or restaurants to get the owner to buy the, uh, the ads. So uh, at the end, I think the important is for all of you to become very sensitive to all the cultural differences. Uh, I advocate, and for many years now, that all schools from K to 12 to add learning Chinese into the core curriculum. Uh, Slowly but surely, it's making some headway, but not enough, okay? 100% uh, of schools still teach Latin. Probably only 1% today teach Chinese. I have no issue about teaching Latin, because I'm a big buff, uh, history buff myself. But how about if somebody is interested in the future? Wouldn't that be kind of useful to, you know, offer them the opportunity to learn, say, a good seven, six, eight years of Chinese? So. Let me close by saying that whether it's hype or not, I believe that the ascent of Asia uh, will offer all of us opportunities times at least two or three times more than what historically we've been seeing in just the Western world alone. So it's a good thing. So in closing, um, free is good if you can figure out a business model that's scalable. Concentrate on what really could make a difference. Get the biggest bang for the buck, 80 and 20. There are always going to be a good and a bad, and just make sure that you know how to manage that. Having taken something very, very long doesn't really count unless you can score a touchdown. And then finally, there's a lot of opportunities out there, and uh, you are extremely well positioned to take advantage of that. So good luck to you. Thank you. I did one year of research. Uh, in, when I graduated that year, uh, Xerox Park was pretty much falling apart. So uh, a company called Olivetti, a European company, PC company at that time, hired a bunch of people from Xerox Park and established a new research center. They're doing a lot of very cool stuff. So I ended up joining them. Instead of joining, uh, my other two opportunities were with IBM Yorktown Heights and AT&T Bell Labs. I decided to take a much smaller company, but closer to the heart of action. Uh, I think I made the right decision there. Okay, so I, I only did one year of research before I started my first company. I was doing some multimedia uh, video server kind of stuff. Yeah. Do you visit for content I'm at Chen at Bravision.com. Yeah. Okay, go to your next class. <laughs>